All right, well, welcome to this uh, most recent podcast with Ultimate Athlete Concepts. My name is Joseph Johnson, owner and founder of Ultimate Athlete Concepts. I'm joined by our good friend Jeff Moyer from DC Sports Training, and we're continuing uh, with our talks with uh, Hank Kreinhoff, uh, uh with the off-the-track stuff. Today we're going to talk about uh, electrostimulation, uh, the use thereof, and hypergravity and training. Thank you very much for joining us again, Hank. I really appreciate your time and expertise. This has been uh, really a great opportunity for me, me as well as all of our listeners, to learn more about what you've done. <laughs> Thank you. So... With with this idea of e-stem, uh, real quick backdrop. You know, uh, uh, it, it, you see, you've seen some new e-stem models start to pop up again. It gotten popular in, in the West. I'm going to say maybe in the 80s, maybe late 70s, we started to hear people talk about it. And this was mainly um, used for athletes after Dr. Yakov Kotz had introduced us to the West. I think in the early 70s in Canada, if I remember correctly, he'd given a talk there, talked about how they had used it. Uh, but it had some problems. One was uh, it was uh it was cumbersome and tedious. Uh, you've actually used it in the training of of your athletes. How did yeah. it? How did how, how? And what I like is that you've tried a lot of different avant garde types of methods, and uh, I'm very curious to see how you've used it, how you implemented it into the training, and, and, and what its effectiveness was for you. Uh, I started using it in 1975, as a matter of fact, as in being an athlete myself, a mediocre athlete, a 400 meter runner, 47.4. And um, I'm not a very, uh, very strong guy, so I try to increase my strength, not with weights, because I'm pretty tall and, 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 and squatting with, uh, let me say, 300 to 400 pounds was a little bit shaky for my, uh, my, uh, my back. So I try to induce, to, to induce uh, uh, strength in my, in my quads. With the use of uh, electrostim, I bought a little machine. It was a kind of, uh, yeah, how do you call this? Uh, we call it tail cell machines. At that time, you could buy it from a television uh, uh, ad um, for, you know, abdominals. Watch TV sure. and make muscles work, and it was right. like that. So it was tiny. It was kind of primitive, but it worked. You don't need too much electricity. Well, it was and anyhow. It was very small. We used to have uh, electrostimulation machines uh, from a physical therapist, purely for physical therapy and, and rehab, for uh, pain killing, uh, for um, iontophoresis, putting substances through the skin by electricity. Um, but it, it, it wasn't used very often. So we used a simple machine on the quads and experimented with it. In 1976 in Holland was the first international congress about electrostimulation, where the Russians, Italians, and uh, and the Germans, uh, and also uh, coaches came who worked with it for the longer time because most of them had studied in Russia and took uh, Kotz's uh, information and, and, and made it work for elite athletes. World championships in uh, in high jump, Mergenburg and Trainhardt were the big names in those days. They used to have the world record at one time, world champions. Um, and they explained us how it really worked, also a little bit of the scientific background and the development of what, and then it became more popular. And then 70s, 80s, it died down again, and then the Compax machine uh, from Switzerland uh, entered the scene, did very good marketing, did very good, uh, um, uh, sold a lot of machines everywhere, specifically for sports, not for uh, losing weight, but specifically for sports and for athletes. And so all of my athletes uh, kind of um, were advised, I advised them to buy uh, one of those uh, machines because we spent in Switzerland for track and field. <coughs> and Zurich and Lausanne, the competitions were there. The people were very helpful, very friendly to, uh, to sell us this relatively cheap uh, machine. Helped us to program the machine and, um, well, used it uh, ever since. And then it died down again and, and it's coming back again. Well, it's like an eternal wave. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you started using it, <clears throat> and, and, and I'm assuming, like you said, you got help from the, the company on how to kind of implement it. Mm -hmm. um, when you did implement it, what? Uh, I, I guess I should back up a little bit. When you've used it, how did you use it? Did you use it, you know, in particular phases of training? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, 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 what kind? Where, where was that implemented? How, how does that fit in the scheme of things? I guess would be the first question. Okay, 
it's <coughs> very specific because you don't have to use your brain to do it. It's only locals. You stimulate the nerve that's going inside the muscle, and then you stimulate the muscle. But it's very non-specific. You don't get any any uh, control from the from your brain. So there's no motor pattern being ingrained. It's very local, and um, it doesn't relate at all to any movement that you're going to make in in competition or in training. And that's a kind of a, a setback. Of course, you could use more electrodes and st stimulate more muscle, but all this stimulated in a way that you would never do in, in competition. Is that a problem? Well, not really, because if you do uh, squats or uh, leg extension or knee extension, it also doesn't look like what you do in competition, but the advantage is you use your brain in order to recruit those muscle fibers. And this is an artificial recruitment. Uh, you basically recruit all the muscle fibers under the, under the electrodes, well, in your brain, it depends on your motivation, how many muscle fibers you can recruit. If you're sitting there, low weight, and you do this uh, leg extension movement, uh, 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 then you don't recruit much muscle fibers. So, um, there's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and I found if people are excellent in lifting weights and they have no problems with injuries, then why use electrostimulation uh, with it? because then the weight will do well. If you have no back problem or, or knee problem, I mainly use it for a couple of purposes. Number one was, um, or is still, muscles that are hard to train, like feet muscles. Nobody's going to grab a pencil or grab a towel for, for three or four weeks, uh, increasing the, the strength. They do it for one day and then they get bored, of course. Right. Now, in that case, electrostimulation is just great. Also for underdeveloped muscles, for instance, if you have a tibialis anterior muscle, or if a small muscle that's un underdeveloped or is labeled painful, um, or there's a disbalance in muscle groups, use it, please. It's very good. That's, uh, that's number one, as, a, as for muscle groups that you don't train otherwise in a better way. Number two is um, using in case of injury. You can't do squats because you've got a, a back problem. You can't do squats because your knee tendons are hurt or your killer tendon hurts. Then, in order to maintain your strength, you use the electrostimulation instead of it. Very good. Works excellent. And the third of it is, sometimes you're in a position that you can't really train what you want, would like to do at that moment. For instance, if you have a long intercontinental flight of 10 to 12 hours, <coughs> and you're sitting in an airplane, and, um, well, it will be a day in which you won't do much before and much after, and you need to keep your muscles uh, uh, toned and... and um, then the electrostim works well. Also to increase the, the muscle pump function and to uh, increase the circulation and to prevent the buildup of fluid in your ankles and your lower legs. And also to tone the muscles again. Uh, athletes having very good results with using electrostim in the airplane or even in a long car drive. So those are the three main things. And the fourth application is uh, we experimented with it. You worked as well with elite athletes who could uh, leg press 600 pounds, and um, they were at the end of the capabilities where things became a little bit risky. And then we put a little bit lower weight, uh, let me say 95%, and then put the electrostim, and then um, in combination of pushing the leg press at the same time, turning up the electricity, so the quads contract at that 100% uh, uh, recruitment by and nervous control from the brain, from the motor centers of the brain, at the same time synchronously with a with a high activation from of the muscles from the from the electro stem, and I think that worked well also. So four possible uses, and none of them is very specific. So I wouldn't be using it in the, let me say, in the specific preparation period. More general specific, for instance, for the feet muscles, in the specific preparation competition period only when in case of injury or in case of uh, travel, or in case you want to keep up the muscle tone and you don't have any barbells around or any weight equipment around it for some, some of these days, sure, then sure. You use it. But mainly in the general preparation period, not specific, because there's other ways to get more specific strength, better ways. Now, now if you were to use it, let's say, now I, I read, <clears throat> I read some, some papers <clears throat> more recently where they've Im implemented it into uh, in addition to normal work, like they do their normal training. This is high level athletes, obviously. Yeah. Do you see that being something that makes sense with a high a high level athlete who maybe, as you know, is starting to get nearer and nearer to their genetic potential, and you know, as a as a as an effect to push the envelope a little bit further? Do you see that being useful there, or or or, or not? I hate pushing the envelope. I hate it because. <laughs> You never know where the end of the envelope is until it's too late. Yeah. 
but most of the time it comes from, okay, we have very powerful um, training system. We're going to talk later about it, about vibration. Or we're going to talk about hypergravity, wearing a weight vest. Now, of course, you can stand on the vibration platform with the weight vest and the electrostim at the same time. But that we're talk <laughs> talking overload. We're not talking overkill here. And this is the big, big uh, thing. People always do something because they hope it will add something to it. Yeah. Yeah. But and, and you could do it from theoretical point of view, and some people are doing it uh, because they're afraid they won't get any result in another way. And I'm afraid that another way might be might be a better a better way too. Another disadvantage of electrostim, it's cheap, it's relatively simple, <coughs> it's practical, it works. But one thing is, in the long term, if you do it for too long, then you're overruling all the um, all the nervous nerve fibers. Uh, uh, from the muscle into the muscle, mm -hmm. and if you do this for too long, and some of, some athletes obviously overdo it, like in creatine, if you take five gram, they take fifty gram. If you do twenty minutes of electrostim, fifteen to twenty minutes, like to do it for three hours. Yeah, right, right. And then right. you run into trouble because you disturb the fine innervation of all the all the all the all the all the, all the, all the nerve fibers running to the capsula, running to the tendon, running uh, to and from the from the muscle. You overrule all of them. You stimulate all of them, and then you can get problems like cramps, tetanic cramps. I've seen it. People cramping, and it's very hard to relax again because they switched on the system by by overdoing it. So, so basically, you know, it's it's used as a tool when other when you've got issues like you like you just mentioned. You've got other things going on there, uh, concerns. That's where it's best implemented. Um, yeah. And uh, as 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 always, and you and I've talked about this a lot. You know, more is not always better. No, normally, more is normally worse. Yeah, there are very, very rare instances where more is better. <laughs> <Where's> better? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's unusual where more is better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty unusual. I, you know, anytime I just I, I actually I just did an, an interview uh, earlier today with uh, a coach, and um, he asked me what would be the most important thing that that I could say to to American coaches, and I said, do less. No matter what, it, what, even if you're doing the wrong thing, do less of it. Yeah, yeah. Because more, yeah. more is always bad, even if it's good or bad. And whatever you're doing, if it's good or bad, at least if you're doing less of it, you know, uh, you're in a better situation. Because because more negates good. If you're doing something good, but if you if it's constantly more and more, then it negates the value of what you were doing. Uh, that's yeah. good, you know. So it, it, even if you're doing the wrong thing. Just do less of it, and the athlete will be in better shape. Absolutely, absolutely. It's irrational to do more. It's no, there's no linear thinking in a biological organ, uh, system. There's no, no, the more, the better, or the heavier, the better. It doesn't work that way. The more aspirin you take, the, the, the faster your headache will wear off. Then you yeah. take a 100 aspirin and see what happens. You know, it's just not true. Yeah, exactly. Most people exactly. understand it in normal life, but... but you know, it seems that sports training is a little bit outside of normal life. Uh, all the rules they apply so neatly and so so smart outside of of uh, training. Yeah, they forget about them when they, when they come to the track or to to, to the pool. It, it gets irrational. I can definitely say that's the case. And, and here in the United States, it's it's cultural. We we think that always you have to do more or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. United <laughs> States, it's, it's we're, we're identified by that. You know, we're always we're, we take everything over the top. Yeah, oh, yeah, we never do anything normal uh, or within reason. So I think that's just kind of a great country too. Don't forget it. Make a, it makes it a great country too. Oh no, right, right. I mean, there's a reason why we're the powerhouse oh. in the world. Oh. But there's, there's like anything else. There's negatives to it too. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. Know, so it's uh, it culturally we can't ever, uh, we can't ever just do stuff in moderation. We don't do anything in moderation. We go over the top with everything. And it's good. Like I said, it's good in many ways. There's a reason why we're the best at a lot of different things because we do push the envelope constantly. But, you know, it, it does. When it comes into our industry, it's, it can be a negative, definitely. Look, if, it, if you've got 10 athletes in the, in the gym or 10 athletes on the track and then you offer nine athletes in order to make one very good athlete, I'm not willing to do that. I want to have 10, 10 very good athletes and not one out of 10 that survives and nine that, that you destroy in the process. So I want to have 10 very good athletes, at least no, I squeeze the best out of them. Right, right, right. I always say we're not training them for the military. This is not that kind of situation where, no, no. you know, it's, it's, you want everybody to survive. You know, 
is kind of the the the, the thought. Uh, so now you've used a Compex mostly, and I have I've, I have a Compex, and I know Jeff's got one too. Uh, real briefly, I'm assuming that you rotated the different modes because they have different modes for strength, explosive strength, endurance, and stuff. I'm assuming you rotated those modes as whatever the phase you were in or whatever whatever the situation presented itself, <laughs> obviously, right? Yeah, but uh, most of the time I, I use the explosive uh, strength. Okay. That's well, the one I use. Gonna... That one has the highest frequency, especially for the, for the fast fibers. Okay. Because maximum strength depends on slow and fast fibers, so you get the lower frequency. So I want to have a higher frequency, so I more sure. or less, not, not exclusively, but at least recruit all the fast fibers in there. Sure, sure. And, 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 and also, that was used up to the to the athlete's tolerance or threshold where they felt to the point of being uncomfortable but not in pain. No, exactly, exactly. They should feel it and they should feel, well, I wouldn't even call it discomfort, but st stay below the pain threshold and, and, and if you don't feel anything, then nothing will happen. You should feel something. But if it becomes discomfort and discomfortable, then number one, that's a, that's a warning signal from the muscle to the body something is wrong. So what happens if something is wrong, you also get it when you have a very heavy load you just let it go. See, at, 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 at your personal best in weightlifting, you lift a high, the body just let go because the Golgi tendon organ sets in. So if you feel pain, then you get all kind of inhibiting signals to the muscle. So it, it doesn't really work. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and so the, the idea, and, and by the way, um, we, we, in cycles where you use it, where do you normally see the adaptation take place? Because we, we know that overuse is going to really, it's going to be a negative if you're using it chronically. What what is a normal? What would you say would be a normal kind of adaptation uh, to to the use of in in maybe a one off season? Where where do you normally see that lay in? Uh, what do you mean in time or in effect? Yeah, like in ter terms of weeks. Like would you, would you be you know would you use it you know four weeks six weeks if the, if let's say you got an athlete who's hurt or and it's and it's for a while uh, or, or whatever the case may be. Where do you normally see the adaptation take place at full adaptation? Mostly in three four weeks. Then you see already see uh, already okay. increase in in. And, and you always see increase if you train anyway, if yeah. it's good. But then you see, and let me say, a significant more increase in, let me say, jumping power. After mm -hmm. three weeks already, you can see it, if you do it well. Yeah. That's not overdoing it every other day, then for 15 to 20 minutes, that's fine. So okay. not 15 to 20 hours, not yeah. every day or two times a day, that, right. that's it. And, and it's about a month or so, and then you've seen what you're going to yeah. see from it for that time frame. Now, with that being the case, uh, too, Hank, would you um, – what would you say is the, the time frame that the body holds that adaptation? How long is that good – would that last? Quite long. The more, the more changes you get into the nervous system, so if you have only in the peripheral system, in the heart or in, in, the, in, the, in the muscle itself, then – and you and you lose pretty quickly because it's more peripheral. Sure. Thing you change in the nervous system, which is so stable that in order to, to change something in the nervous system, you have to have a high frequency or a long duration or a high intensity. And everything that's more central regulated um, is more difficult to change. That's why it's difficult to increase speed. Yeah. But when it's there, it stays for the longest time. So that's the good thing about electrostimulation. When you have those changes in the nervous system or in the nerves, nerve cells or in the uh, synapse, then it will stay for the longest time because then there's most of the time a structural change in the system already. It's far more, st it's far more stable because the CNS, yeah. as you're saying, the CNS is harder to affect, and when you do affect it, it holds it. Yeah, holds that application yeah. longer. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. Yeah, so that's what you're talking about here. Yeah, right, right. Now, so if to, just to quickly review, if you do use it, you've already mentioned the uses thereof. You'd be using it earlier in the year. You wouldn't be using it close to competitions. So that would be, so if you were using it, it'd be prior to se segments, like we've talked about earlier, before vibration. Vibration yep. will be closer to the season. Exactly. Whether it be single limb or whole body would be closer to the competition of the season. Electro stem would be a couple you know, months back prior yep. Uh, yep. in general. And you would cease the use of electro stimulation before that. When you start implementing vibration, then the if you were using that, then the, the electrostimulation will be gone at that point. Yeah. They would not Perfect. be concurrent ever. Perfect, because um, electrostimulation might also change something in your proprioceptives and your coordination. A little bit, not much, and vibration doesn't do that at all. Basically because 
you might stimulate the quads, but what about the hamstrings and the glutes and the, and, 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 and the gar- calf muscle? Well, basically nothing. And with all body vibration, at least, you stimulate all the muscles at the same time. So they all get stronger. So they, 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 they all get stronger. And with electrostim, only one muscle gets stronger. Yeah, right. Right, so and, and I would assume that the the, the vibration was a, the easier and most effective tool for you to use because of that. It's it was seamless because they all they got to do is stand on five minutes, maybe up to ten, and they're on and off. You can do it right in the session. You don't have to hook them up to stuff, um, and there's no pain, there's no discomfort, and like you said, you cover the whole waterfront while they're staying there. You don't have to worry about muscle groups in particular. So the whole body vibration really has a high level of effect, and especially because you mentioned before that the body um, continues to adapt to vibration even year to year, uh, as opposed to just it being a one-time improvement. You'll see that from year to year as you uh, recheck the the EMGs and to see what you're you're, now you're maybe responding to a different frequency from year to year, but you're still adapting. Yep. And I think that's the main big advantage there with whole body and single limb vibration, from what I understand. Uh, yeah, and also it's mechanical, it's not electrical. Of course it's electrical, but it's electrical through your own nervous system that can handle the load, while electricity is superimposed on, and it, it, you, your nervous system, nervous system cannot escape. And, and, and in vibration, it's, it's kind of uh, easier. It's a mechanical stimulus. So yeah. indirectly you stimulate the nervous system, not directly. Yeah. So it also means you're also stimulating the bone tissue, which you don't in electric stimulation. Um, also, you're having an effect on the hormonal system. We discussed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Which, which I, you know, I was, um, um, I was, I was pleased to hear that that that, that was in fact because I'd heard some conflicting stories about the hormonal profile. But like you said, the the growth hormone and testosterone are actually positively affected by uh, the vibration. So that's a that's another. I mean, piece of good news, obviously, uh, for any athlete. Probably because a lot, a lot of muscle tissue in electrostim, you only lose the quads or the hamstrings, and now you have this whole body electrostim, which is a nice uh, gimmick more than anything else. You don't see people really using it or getting advantage of it. I mean, you get a lot of stimulation. It's like hitting somebody uh, on the head with a hammer. <laughs> Right. <laughs> hey, you're a tough guy if you can handle it. So yeah, yeah, makes, right. If you can survive, you so, so, oh, more power to you, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> <coughs> so that leads us to our other uh, other topic of novel, or if you want to call it novel, uh, means of training, hypergravity, which is uh, something that you've used. And I hear the word thrown about a lot in the United States, but it doesn't. they're not talking about the, the hypergravity training. They're talking about hypergravity uh, they use it very loosely in terms of hypergravity training, but it's not the same thing, or hypergravity muscles, training hypergravity muscles. Uh, yes. And they use it in this very loose way, but hypergravity training is actually a means of, of training, of developing more uh, power for an athlete. Tell me about it, because to be honest with you, there's really nothing, you don't see hardly anything written on that in the United States. Tell me about it. True. Sure. Um Again, the, the developer of the of the methodology was uh, again Carmelo Bosco, who had a wide range of uh, interests. And one of his interests was, of course, in on planet Earth, gravity. And then uh, through research in space, you get microgravity, less gravity. So the muscles uh, kind of adapt to that, and they shrink. You get atrophy of muscles for cosmonauts or astronauts in space. Now, what happens in some other on some other planets? There's more gravity than on planet Earth. So his idea was, what would happen to muscles if there's more gravity? Well, in order not to uh, to uh, to uh, 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 not to shrivel, your anti-gravity muscles have to work hard because it's 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 pulling on you 24 hours a day and seven days a week uh, in another on another planet. And he said, what what would happen if we would do the same thing? And the muscles will respond to that to a long duration of of uh, increased uh, force, my own body weight, uh, as a matter of fact. So what would happen if I would lose on planet Earth by wearing a weight vest, let me say, 12 hours a day. You don't sleep with a weight vest on. It doesn't help anyway because you're sleeping and you're lying down. Right. But especially when you're standing up, and that, that's like, uh, oh, maybe 16 hours a day, but not in training because in training it would be uh, too, uh, too, too, too much risk for injuries if you increase and he was 
the research was only 13% of your body weight. 13% of your body weight during three weeks. So three weeks every day, use a weight vest with 30% of your body weight. And you do this for, let's say, basically all day when you sit, when you stand, when you walk, but not during training. For those two hours or maybe three hours or whatever, four hours, you put it away. And when the training is done, you put it on again. You can still use it in the warming up when you're jogging a little bit, that's fine. But not when you do actual work up, especially not when jumping and running uh, with the with the vest. That sure. wouldn't make sense. And the effect of this is that you you got 1.1 g g is your own body weight. You got 1.1 g, but 16 hours a day. So you got a very uh, a wide uh, band of, of uh, one. This is, so this is 1 g. This is 1.1 g over here. When you do it three times your body weight, say so two times your body weight in uh, squats, let's say. Uh, when you weigh uh, 200 pounds, okay, you take another uh, 400 pounds on your neck, then you do squats with it. Of course, it's high G, it's 3G. But how many, wait a minute, how many seconds I'm talking about? And the rest of the day, you're not exposed to that G. So you get, a, instead of this band, you get a very high peak here when you do the weightlifting, but you can count the seconds. So the total exposure in the surface is much higher in the 1.1 times 16 hours than in the 3G for, when say, one minute. And that's where the effect comes from. So the effect is uh, long because it's uh, a long duration of, of uh, exposure to this uh, specific stimulus. And, and if I remember correctly, you said that, that it, normally the body holds that adaptation for several months afterwards, after yep. the three weeks. Yep. I've measured it and I've seen, uh, let's say, uh, increased uh, uh, in, uh, increased explosive strength that maintained for the longest time didn't return at all, uh, as a matter of fact. Okay. So that was, that was really, really good for a long time, much longer than we expected. And when maybe after three weeks we'll be back to square one, or where we started from to baseline, and it wasn't. It so lasts for three to four months all through the season. I could see that the effect of, uh, because you I measure my athletes lots of times, because I was interested in what would happen, of course, and I'm right. met them anyway. So I could uh, could perfectly see the, the the great result of hypergravity, just like Carmela Bosco uh, published in his in his uh, articles. But his articles are mainly published in German language. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked it up and and I I saw a few references to it, but like you said, there's not a lot of you know there's not uh, a high volume of stuff on it. You know, no. out there, there's a few little things in English. Um, now, with that being the case, you, now did you say thirty percent of the? So if you got a two hundred pound guy, he's got sixty pound vest on. No, thirteen. One thirteen. Three. Okay, because I. Know. Okay, that's what I had thought you had said earlier. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. So, so you're, you know, a, a guy that that is that size, he'll put on a vest that's maybe six, you know, fifteen pounds, uh, yeah. you know, give or take. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and and that will do it. Now I'm looking at a study that he did uh, right now on PubMed. Uh, that showed 11% uh, that they're claiming in this study. It, was there a little bit of a range on that, or, or was 13 kind of in stone? No, no, it was 13%, 1.13G. 1 Why the 13? I have no idea. You have to start from somewhere. I think he, he took it from another planet or something, you know, 1.1G, <laughs> 1, 1 uh, some, some like Jupiter or Pluto, with a, I don't know which one, with a higher gravity. So I, he took it from there, from somewhere. You have to start from somewhere, just like vibration or any new intervention, which is completely new. You have to start from somewhere and to see if, if it works. If not, you can increase it or decrease it with 1.13% was the one he started with. Well, I where, that was what, what he used. Okay, now, uh, now the interesting part uh, uh, is, is the results. And I want to ask you one other question and get that part from you too. The, uh, this, as we talked about before, hypergravity would be used in that segment right preceding the three weeks preceding when you're getting ready for a competition and then where you might have been using your vibration and stuff. Hypergravity no. would be in the segment right before that, correct? Exactly. Because three weeks leading up to it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you use it only uh, um, during normal activity and then the training, during training, you will still kind of feel something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't really disrupt your your coordination. It's not that you're walking like a robot or something. Yeah, it's not overly heavy. I mean, it's something that you, <laughs> no. could, you could work with. No. Now, um, with with the use thereof, 
the, some of the stuff that I saw was uh, one of the studies showed a four inch improvement in vertical jump in at the end of the three weeks. Oh yeah. Um, explain that to me because that's huge. Is this for, <laughs> is this what did you what did you see? What what kind of results did you see? I saw in not four inches. I saw somewhere between well. More two or three inches. I have the data somewhere in a huge package here, <coughs> but somewhere between two and three inches after three weeks of uh, using it. And you're talking world class athletes too. You're not talking about yeah, kids. Yeah. No, they weren't sports. They were very well trained athletes. People running close to twenty seconds in the two hundred meters. So these are people that don't put two to three inches on their vertical in four weeks doing anything else. Yeah, you know, exactly. at that stage of the game. Just trained like normal, like they would normally do without. So there's nothing changed. Right. Only that was added to the to the training. Right. They no. they had never see that you would normally not see that kind of an improvement with other training means within a month's time with athletes that are on that level. No, the only thing that could, could come close is vibration. Then again, but that that's only what come close. But hypergravity, the only thing was but hypergravity that they uh, and it was more my concern than their concern that I found it socially limiting. Let me say you go into yeah, a bar. Right. Where there's a kind of a, like a bulletproof vest, you know, and people are asking questions. Or nowadays, uh, you have dynamite or any explosion. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, you, that, that, you that cannot line, do it in a third I, world they country. Did, they didn't matter at all. They right. didn't care at all. Well, you know, like if you know what it's going to do for you, and you're you're on that level, you're pretty much willing to do most anything uh, to, to, to help out and. And it's really, it's not that terrible, you know, it's not painful, it's a little bit socially awkward, but other than that, to get the kind of result that you're talking about, that's that's amazing. Now, did, yeah. was the main uh, mechanism of measuring its effectiveness, was vertical jump, was that the main way you measured it? Or, or could you tell me some any kind of uh, relationships to the running speed? Was there Did you find connections, direct connections there as well? Um, yeah, well, that wouldn't be really fair, because... Uh the aim of all training, all the other training, was increase in running speed as well. So it's hard to find that... Uh, to put a number on it. Yeah, also because there's, there's, a, there's a circumstances like headwind or tailwind in the beginning of the season. So people might be flying and say, wow, that, that, that's really... But it might be coincidence. There's not a strong relationship. I think there is because it was if it was only for the explosive strength, that increased a lot. So you always see a good relationship between explosive strength and running speed. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, <laughs> but to running speed, yeah, I think so. I think so. It helped. I think so. It helped. And in like, general, you could say for most athletes, uh, that an overall increase in power. Would that athlete also see an in, an increase in power to their upper upper body as well, yeah. or is it mainly? It's not just so. It's more of a nervous system thing as opposed to uh, localized. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And the only thing is, if you wear it on the very Tiny athletes like 800 meter run girls, and uh, they have a little bit pain in the beginning. They have a little bit pain in the shoulders because uh, it's, sure. it's it's yeah. dragging down a little bit. Sure. But the normal sprinters, especially the men, they don't care about this 30 percent of body weight carrying it around. Yeah, it doesn't bother them at all. So, no. so with with with, uh, with that being the case, uh, you would also uh, we want to qualify. It's mainly for higher level athletes. You you kind of when you're trying to break through thresholds uh, of improvement. It's not yeah. so much necessary for a low-level athlete. No, there's better ways to improve. You never play a trump, trump card in the beginning of the game. You always keep it, keep it until you got run out of, and you want to have a surprise in the end. But not, not, and not in the beginning. There's better ways to to do it. You have a certain level of technique and a certain level of conditioning before you can start thinking about these things. The same applies to vibration or electrostimulation. If you can get that through a normal way, why going through the pain? If you're still increasing ten inches yeah. every year, every year. Then why go through the pain of awareness for for three right. weeks? Right. This is for for when all the other methods start to slow down and their effectiveness sure. starts to become yeah. more problematic or just you know they're they're stagnating. You want to push them through training stages. Yeah, the law of diminishing returns when it sets in when your performance starts to level off. Not really, but you're not making that great progress that you did five six years ago, and you want to get a breakthrough. Then. Use a uh, hypergravity. Why not? Right, 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 right. And, and that so that context needs to be so. And, and from what I understood, uh, from what you've said before, you're going to use it once a year uh, when you do start using it normally. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's that, that's right. Uh, apart from the fact that we in Europe have because of the bad weather always an indoor season, and then. 
for one athlete, we use it twice a year before okay. indoor world championships and before the outdoor world championships. So okay. we, we use it uh, twice in the periodization uh, scheme. It's a double periodization there. Okay, okay. And, and it's used year to year without any stagnation. You're going to still see some adaptation to it every yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Which, yeah. Is, which is huge. So if you're seeing those kinds of improvements and you know you're going to see an, an additional improvement the next year using it, uh, that's huge. It's kind of um, uh, reassuring to know you can kind of come back to that again and, and get continued improvement for the athlete. It puzzles me that nobody, nobody, not more people are thinking about it and for sure and did research about it and for sure that no more people used it. I, I'm puzzled by that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, you, I, I think that you were the first person to uh, turn me on to the whole idea. I, I'd heard about it, but I didn't know the specifics. And so mm -hmm. you're, you're the first person that I know that used it. Okay, okay. So I, I should say that. You're the first person I know that did it. And yeah. I, I, you know, b because not being a scientist myself or even having a degree in the field, I always uh, am limited to what were the results and then mm -hmm. work my way backwards. I don't like to listen to a bunch of stuff because they, uh, mm -hmm. they may be over and, and they lose me. And it sounds great. But then you found out it didn't work. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can relate to that, but that's that's always been my been my approach. I wanted to know results first and then find out. You explain it to me later. But I want to know if it works first, you know, because yeah, as, as you know, the, the, there's been a huge advent, especially in the United States, of complicated theories, uh, or, or, you know, on different things, And but it doesn't work. I've been sidetracked by a scientist many, many times. And so, hey, oh, is, yeah. Um, I, 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 found, I found out from experience, it took a while, that uh, scientists love to pontificate on things that may not have any validity or value, um, especially if it was their idea. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. Uh, and then when you get down to the practical part that it doesn't work, really doesn't seem to bother them too much, but it does me because, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. you know what I mean? Because that's, that's what I was reading for was some, some effectiveness you know, and some results, you know, uh, right. not, not how flowery, the, flowery their language could be or how smart they sounded. So uh, I always like, I love, this has been real great for me because uh, with you being like-minded in terms of does it work or not is, is the biggest issue uh, more so than what they were talking about. I don't really care about that. I just care whether or not it works. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in my situation, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of, I, you know, Dr. Yes has, has kind of been my, you know, he, he had kind of enlightened me to most of what the Russians were doing. So it, it come up in conversation, but he had never used it either. You know, it wasn't something that was part of his, uh, protocol or, or any of the other guys that I, that I knew. So for you, you're like the first person to turn me on to that whole idea and, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice you think about, okay, don't need it now, but you know, in a couple of years, maybe with an athlete who I'm dealing with, who mm -hmm. is starting to push his genetic potential, that's a great tool that you can bring into the picture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do yeah. you have the search on, on, uh, on hypergravity and did I send you already or not? You sent me one or two things, but I don't know if I got it. I, you know, you sent me a collection of things. There was may have been one paper on it, but I don't know if there was a lot. I think uh, I found some some more back in my stack of hard copies that I have over here. Well, I, <laughs> we would we would love to look at that. You, as you know, <laughs> obviously that would be great. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, but anyway, I want to thank you for for doing this and, and answering all these questions because man, this is this has been really great. And 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 then and on our future uh, talks together, we're gonna get on the track and kind of oh. talk about the running part, the the stuff that. Uh, that everybody I know wants to hear about as well. So I want to thank you for your time today, and I'm looking forward to the next ones because I'm excited. I know Jeff is too. He's got more questions than I do. So uh, <laughs> he's actually going to start talking. Okay. It's going to be a new feature on the next on on the future podcast. I'm going to shut up for a while, and Jeff's going to talk, and so that'll be uh, that'll be fun for him. I know, and for me too. Uh, so I can kind of just listen and learn. So. Thanks a lot, guys, and, and uh, we'll be talking soon.